Good morning, viewers. Welcome to Frankly Speaking with Vibhuti Jha. It's 14th of August. This is not India's Independence Day. India's Independence Day is tomorrow, 75th. So greetings to India and every Indian all over the world. Happy 75th. And this is a very historic moment. We have completed three quarters of a century. Those who are familiar with cricket, they know the century is a big uh, milestone in the game of cricket. And right now, England and you, uh, India are playing a test match in UK. So it is a very interesting time to be in the game. Having said that, what is important for us to figure out <coughs> where we have been and where we are heading towards. And mm -hmm. that's a very important point for us to think about. I remember during my school days, we used to study Hindi poetry. And there used to be, there is a poem by Maitli Sharan Guptaji. And that is such a quintessential statement. It's actually living up to the Hindu philosophy. Who am I? Where am I going? What am I heading to? Hum kaun the kya ho gaye aur kya honge abhi? Aao vichare aad mil kariye samasyaan sabhi. Now the question is, that actually summarizes the today's corporate world's vision statement. Who am I, where am I, and where am I heading to? That's what is corporate vision statement. So to discuss India's state of the union, as I chose the word from the American politics, India's state of the union on the 75th birthday. It, state of the union between India and US relationship, that's also very critical because India and United States have been through what I call part of the famous song, India and US have for far too long been part-time lovers. You know, it's time to seriously consider the relevance of the relationship. And if there is anything in the relationship, how can it go forward? We have talked about being strategic relationships, strategic partner, natural allies, greatest of democracies, diversity, people's togetherness, all that has been great. But at the political level, somewhere along the line, there is a need for a new focus. And finally, I wanted to talk about, it's like the movie, Return of the King, uh, the famous movie about, uh, I, I'm forgetting the name, but Return of the King is something dangerous about this Wuhan virus. And I still will call Wuhan virus. The Delta variant is back. We all know how India was hit hard on the Delta variant in the second wave. It's here in our backyards in the United States. And we do not, it's, it is hitting hard from the newspaper reports and whatever we witness and see, it is really hitting hard. So since the experiment was done on human mice about this particular uh, research of, of the virus, I do not know, I'm reminded, I'm worried actually about this. Is somebody doing some mischief, a la what was Mission Impossible 2, but since it was tested on human mice, are they releasing the virus somewhere on the line? Conspiracy theory or just about the stupidity of this bald head that is talking to you right now. But I'm angry. I'm angry about it for the simple reason that millions of people have lost their lives, 4 million plus globally in peacetime without their fault. And we are still trying to rub the wound between vaccine or no vaccination. I mean, what is the state of our education and understanding the common sense? That's what is worrisome when people disregard the, 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 the obvious warnings that are involved with it. So discuss this, all these three issues. I have great privilege and pride in welcoming three very aware physicians and uh, Dr. Krishna Bhatt from Maine. He's a surgeon and a urologist and uh, nothing more relevant today than to learn the art of relax. And Dr. Bhatt has created an app called R-E-L-A-X-X -X, Relax. I would urge all of you who are watching, download it. It's free to download and experience various forms of meditation, calming influences, the element called intermittent silence that will help you in these uncertain tough times. 
Bhavani Srinivasan, a great friend, doctor, welcome to the show. You are a remarkable physician. You know, you have been involved with community activities and your spirit and energy is something that I've always admired. So God be with you with all your energy and want to hear and rack your brain with uh, all the three issues that we have talked about. And finally, dear, dear Dr. Rakesh Sharmaji, he's a frontline warrior in the COVID war. And Dr. Rakesh Sharma is a dear friend. All three of you are. Rakesh and I shared another issue that he gave the COVID test to my whole family and declared <laughs> it's free from it. So Rakesh, thank you very much. <coughs> We're still on the front line of COVID war. So let's get back to celebration of India's 75th. And I would request, I would this time, I don't believe in the concept of ladies first, but I'll give Bhavani the first shot on India's 75th anniversary and uh, birthday, freedom, and was it only a transfer of power? So your thoughts on India's 75th? Yeah, India embarks on this particular birthday with uh, a lot of, uh, um, for want of a better word, stuff going on everywhere. Uh, somebody once likened India to, be a, to a nice house uh, in a uh, in an not a very good neighborhood. And I think, uh, you know, that, that uh, remark is a very telling one. Here we are on the 75th birthday, we are beset from within and without. So, you know, from without, you know, with, uh, with the US troops uh, pulling out of uh, Afghanistan, we've got the uh, Taliban now uh, entrenching themselves in various positions. So, um, and here, you know, we have uh, Pakistan always spoiling for a fight. So one wonders, Bhavani, you know, can I, those... can I, Bhavani, can I inter interrupt here? Sure. Would, would you try to look at me? Uh, at oh, the okay. Point, it looks like you are looking in the sky. So, okay. Yeah, this is better. This is better. Go ahead. Okay. Please. So uh, one wonders whether Pakistan and uh, the Taliban are uh, going to join forces and, you know, attack India, which is a very good... Uh, uh, possibility and one quails at that thought and on the other hand you have uh, China on the other flank who also has uh, has uh, tried and um, you know at the most uh, he, they are being staved off and not only that that's from without from within here we have on the uh, on our in West Bengal we've got uh, folks like Mamta Banerjee who has uh, um, who's, who's uh, anti-social, <laughs> to say the least. And the, and the fact of the matter is, ordnance factories, which produce our defense supplies, are located, they're headquartered in Calcutta. And uh, because of, apparently uh, the last time in the 60s when we had uh, skirmish with China, those ordnance factories shut down their production hampering uh, uh, our troops no end at the border. So this time what Mr. Modi has done, starting in 2014, he has slowly introduced new laws and regulations. And uh, now they, they, those um, are, are now uh, come under the, uh, if not exactly nationalized, at least they now have rules and regulations in place where the leftist unions cannot strike at the time when we need all those uh, munitions and those supplies the most. So that is one thing which, uh, you know, which was a positive note. But uh, otherwise, and then 75th birthday, we also have COVID, which reared its ugly head all throughout uh, this year. India was doing beautifully, beautifully till March end, and suddenly April, the beginning of April, saw the, the Delta wave uh, uh, crossing the shores of India and creating havoc there, even with the folks who were immunized. And India was still in the process of getting a lot of people immunized because a very a small fraction of the population had been had received their immunizations at that point. So, you know, it just, it's um, a... Um, you have given, given the warning signs that India needs to take care of uh, with the internal and within, very well said, about the enemies within and enemies outside and things that are worrisome on the 75th. Um, anything good that you see, Dr. Sharma? 
if I just say what good things I see, I'll be very partial to those people who do not see good things often. <laughs> um, well I, and, I, and I'm serious. I, I'm a big fan of my own uh, country of origin, but at the same time, I'm a true critic. I don't want to say India has the fifth largest uh, economy of the world. No, no, the, let's, let's not go into that conversation. Yeah. You are absolutely yeah. right. Those are the I'm facts. I'm looking at it from this point of view that... Yeah. So what, I'm just going to... The thing that we are looking at... Yes, oh, what I'm going to comment on is, on 75th anniversary, what did we achieve in India? I don't want to compare ourselves with China, but at the same time, you cannot ignore it either. Let's say India's economy is the fifth largest by, uh, right now. So GDP has grown, gone, uh, grown up to 1,600 plus billion US dollars. But if I tell you a, a data that 68% of Indians are poor, a common person living outside India will say, what are you talking about? If you are the fifth largest economy, how can 68% of your countrymen be poor? But that is the truth. What has happened is we have created fifth largest economy, but the benefit has only gone to 10, 15% of the people. 68% people have not seen any, any benefit at all. <laughs> when I say any benefit, I don't mean zero, means significant or substantial. 68% of Indians live under $2 a day. Of course, a dollar could be 75 rupees, but 150 rupees a day for 68% Indians. And we say we are the fifth largest economy so the point here is there's a lot of disparity. That, num that GDP, uh, that fifth largest economy, yes. dwarfs because we are the third largest country in terms of the pur purchasing power parity basis. Yes. So again, just as today we pay $4.19 or $3.19, depending on the quality or the brand of milk you buy per gallon. When I came here, we were paying 79 cents or 99 cents. So there is a th thing called purchasing power parity in which India is still ranks number three. So the point of the matter is, yes, India has a long way to go and you have brought that to attention very, very seriously. And that's what is important. I keep telling people in India that 1.3 billion people is not a good story. We are far too many people right now. Mm. Something has to happen because every measure in India falls short because there are too many people to attend to. India is what I call is a 1.3 billion problem country. Anything you want to, to try, it is a 1.3 billion problem. And I totally agree with you, Rakesh, on this, is that there is so much more to do. But Krishnaji, what do you see in your point of view? What do we celebrate in the 75th birthday? Is there something to celebrate? instead of worrying about the, the tough times that people generally have. Bhutiji, you know, I really will take you to your childhood. You know, you grew up there, I grew up there, many of us grew up. And as we were talking before the show, many of us who are ordinary people, we felt extraordinary that day. Many of us who are unimportant people felt important that day. In the beginning, I think many years after independence, there was a inertia. It's like British mentality and, and of course the rulers kept on the same kind of a trajectory and momentum. But I see a big shift in that. I mean, look at uh, what happened in Kashmir. I mean, that also happened in 5th of August, right? It's the same, you know, it's like it's coming up first year. Then what happened in Ram Mandir. So there is a big shift of feeling important and, and trying to become an entrepreneur mindset, population. I think it's all coming together. And I think those are the good signs I see, good signs and good things to celebrate for. Yes, it may take few more years. I mean, that is part of democracy. I mean, we are not. China, like, uh, you know, the government can do whatever they want. <coughs> we have a thriving democracy and 
during that framework a lot has changed and the mindset is changing and people are really independent now i think when i was in you know uh, in the 60s and 70s our mindset we, we were still opening doors of our professors and and i don't know if it still goes on now but it, the sir culture and the you know it's like natmastak i think that thing is changing a lot in society and that social change may reflect in economic change and power change and yes we have neighbors not friendly you know like israel also has neighbors that are not friendly but is that a challenge you know that india can face and it seems like it's a different india now than you know it was few years ago when we were taking punches now we are willing to give it back so there are you know there is a mindset change and that mindset change may translate um you know is uh, for for better of india thank you very much for putting through a, 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 a you know a mind that is getting out of the state of decolonized mind you know like it was we had been so so seriously colonized is that colonial mentality that had seeped in us we have all i think by and large we are all belong to the same generation and one of the things the five ways that the colonial mentality manifested itself in india was everything india is inferior right mm. we were all inferior people our color was inferior we were dying for being fair and lovely and <laughs> creams were things like that they made us feel that indians are inferior people you physically you are weak that's why we beat the hell out of you and we ruled you you know not only that they began to successfully demonstrate it to us that we were poor in mind despite our vedic knowledge and everything else that they could happily divide us mercilessly and rule over us and for me the the breaking point came when i looked up the 1941 census of india and it is shocking to know that just about 101 145000 brits were in this country in india plus women and children they ruled us millions right using us our people our resources against us killing us dividing our country the way as if we, to use the bihari slang unke baap ki property thi as if they thought it was their own stuff i i'm angry about that when i read that read these colonization and in which they left behind a colonial debt where eminent historians and gentlemen like shashi tharoor and other would say let's be grateful to the british they left a railways and they left uh, you know english language a colonial debt that we are still living under of the english language they destroyed ourselves so my thought process here is that between and as dr krishna ji pointed out that modi ji has brought that sense of pride back in in hindus and i use the word hindu deliberately because it is almost a phobic thing that if you said you are a hindu you are you are a dangerous guy we are not we are the most friendly people on the planet earth we have never fought a war to hoist our flag or our linguistic domination nothing yet we are the ones who are under attack so coming back to that same 15th august uh, celebrations that are important uh we will not know what is happening tomorrow in on uh, on that side but there is a new phrase that has come about the left liberal gang it's called the leli gang you may have heard about that these people have dominated and they are the ones who are creating the maximum disturbance in india so if prime minister modi were to ask you bhavani one suggestion one suggestion no more than one one suggestion that you could give to tackle this group of people what will be your number one priority that they must be hit with well uh, there's a group called the uscirf yes the united states uh, committee for international religious freedom right. those guys have ngos who are well funded in india who proselytize who um you know try to change the uh, dialogue and who fund all these left liberal folks they and various other missionary groups so if uh, mo if uh, if i had to say something to modi ji i would say number one with uscirf 
they have every single religion rep represented on earth in that panel except Hindus. So first... Is it so? I didn't know that. Okay. Yes. Oh, okay. So number one, he should say that, you know, we need, if they are going to, you know, dictate, if they are going to operate within India's borders, if they're going to, you know, have uh, various um, groups uh, in, in, within the confines of India, they need to have Hindu representation sitting at the table. We all know that phrase, you know, if, you're, if, you're, if you don't have a seat at the table, you're probably on the menu. And Hinduism has always been on their menu they they propagate and they promote hindu phobia and uh, so called you know hindutva which which has now gotten a bad rap so that is one thing that he should absolutely uh, insist on that you know they cannot operate unless they have hindu representation within their ranks and the second thing is i think he's already doing only it but i only sorry one. i said only one oh, okay <laughs> well, there you go i want i want a hindu representation on that all right, very important. That's, that's important. Because they have that's, an international. That's, that's I think. I think. I'm glad you brought that forth because I. I didn't know, and uh, I'm. I'm 100 sure that many did not know about it. So thank you for bringing that matter to the attention, Dr. Sharma ji. Same question to you, and I would add one more to you know. Same to you, but I would say to add to Bhavani's question is, I'm seriously believe begun to believe that the whole concept of freedom of religion is anti-India, because we already have freedom of religion. India, Sanatan Dharma has always <coughs> offering is free, it's truly free democratic way of life. Freedom of religion is a Western concept. So in a world dominated by three religions, Jewish, Islam and Christianity, what, what is the freedom all about? Mm -hmm. Freedom to convert or uh, to kill the pagan? What, what, what was this all about? So I'm going to say my suggestion to Prime Minister Modi would be abrogate the concept of freedom of religion and conversion, ban conversion in country. Take the leadership role on that. That would be my suggestion. Take the leadership role on that because in my opinion, if God is the ultimate magician, each one of us here, he could have made Bhavani as Betty, Rakesh as Rocky, Krishna as King, Vibhuti Jha as Ho Chi Min, whatever. But God did not do that. He made us who we are. So I have begun to talk with my American friends and Muslim friends that you guys are converting, making, committing sin against God's original intent when you push for conversion. That is a sin against God's original intent. Sharma ji, what will advice kya hoga, Modi ji on the 75th birthday of the country? <clears throat> I think Modi ji needs more than a dozen advices. Yes. So one will not do enough job. So one per person? Then yes. he will have 1.3 billion advice, no? <laughs> yeah. um, I, of course, we all love our religion and India lacks... Uh, lacks into where uh, right thing should be done as far as conversions are concerned. The agency that Bhavani ji just mentioned, in fact, if you read that agency's report of the last so many years, India has uh, so many laws already on the books. Every state has its own law. I have re read it extensively. Madhya Pradesh, uh, Bihar, uh, so Rajasthan, they have laws against conversion. And most of the states made these laws in 1950s and 60s. According to this US agency, not a single Indian person or organization has ever been convicted in the last 75 years for converting Hindus into any other religion. If I give you one quick example, in Madhya Pradesh, there is a law that if you want to convert you must file with the collector of the district months in advance that I'm a Hindu, I want to convert into Christianity or Islam. And if that application goes in time and then it will be looked upon, if there's no objection by the authorities, you'll be allowed to convert. If we believe in that law and that theory, millions and millions of Indians have been converted in the last 75 years and not a single Indian or organization has ever been punished or brought to justice. 
So making laws makes no sense at all. If I tell Modi ji, make a law, that doesn't do any good. So that's the conversion issue. Now, what advice would I give to Modi ji? Advice that I want to give to Modi ji is, just like in good, decent countries, example being Israel, if you want to run for uh, MP or, or uh, MLA or any such election, you must work in Indian Armed Forces for three years or five years. If you don't do that, you just cannot hold any official uh, 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 elected post. You just cannot contest. Uh, that's, that's what happens in Israel. And that's what should happen in India. Because what we have is almost plenty of Indians who are traitors, whether it's a Congress people or Ayer who goes to Pakistan and have secret meeting or Rahul Gandhi and Sonia Gandhi who has secret meeting with China. If all these powerful politicians are trying to sell the India, then why do we elect them? Have them work in Indian armed forces so that they start love, to love their country before they can uh, be a traitor to the country. That's, a, that's one idea, which is my favorite idea, actually, for the youth. You know, if you were to, today India has, you know, army is 1.4 or 2 million or whatever number of people. It still is the world's second largest army. I was thinking about it, that youth must be, must be made to serve. This the country needs a draft kind of a thing, where every youth gets a graduate degree, gets to into the armed forces. That will do a couple of things. One is what you rightly said, bring about a national identity, put them into a training. They will get, have a sense of discipline, you know, about, you know, you can't achieve, you know, in the armed forces, you have to be ready to, you have to be battle ready all the time. Once this happens, is it, you know, what is the collateral, the lateral advantage or collateral advantage? If every Indian youth is trained in armed forces, Pakistan ki to khadiya khadi ho jayegi usi mein. Think about it. Imagine millions of Indian youth are part of the Indian armed forces. What will happen to every 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 country that wants to take chances with India? That's a great idea. But there must be practical problems from doing that in terms of democratic freedom and choice of occupation. Mm. Krishnaji, uh, your suggestion to Prime Minister Modi, one suggestion. Um, Vibhuti ji, um, my suggestion, of course, uh, uh, is to continue the path Modi ji is taking already, um, is not to focus so much on the left liberal. Of course, you want to make sure that their funding and they're within the you know, rules that uh, uh, Rakesh ji said, there is already rules there but promote more Hindu kind of uh, ethos and culture. Like, uh, as we m mentioned earlier, Ram Mandir is already an entity. It right. makes many Hindus feel proud. Right. If you see what is happening in Varanasi, I mean, it's, Varanasi will become an amazing place. He, he, when he adopted Varanasi, it sounded like he, this is just a place where he's going to fight election. Like, um, Rahul Gandhi did from, you know, another place in South India, but it was not. I think he really adopted and he had all this vision that he was going to do. So I think do more of what, you know, you can do for Hindus, like he did that uh, a statue, you know, of liberty, you know, uh, there in, uh, in Gujarat. Patel's, 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 uh, yeah, Patel's. Yeah. Um, I just want to share with Bhuti ji, the first time I ever met Modi ji was in Delhi when he was Sarasang Chalak, not in politics. And that in that meeting, he had invited all the church heads of India and Mahesh Mehta was there. And at that time, I, I, I could see how much he was you know, absorbing, you know, from everything. So he understands I think everybody, but where do you put your energy? I mean, do you, if you take a step against left liberal openly, then you will have be wasting your energy because the fight will continue. You're not going to change them. 
their thoughts or their behavior. And at the moment, they are more angry because they want Modiji gone. They want the whole thing gone. So they are trying to kind of, you know, to find just unke under me aara hai. But they are not able to do what they could do when the Congress was there, except in certain pockets. Like Andhra is a, you know, is a problem place. But I think he should focus on just and you know, uthao, you know. Um, that's a, that I I told, I agree with you that there are so many things to do uh, that you can't you can't be worried about the negatives or people who are trying to do. But at the same time, geopolitically speaking and political survival wise, when you know that the left liberal gang is trying to besmirch you and trying to destroy you, you have to also take defensive actions. And I'm talking about not spend energy, but ensure that they are not able to do the damage that they are capable of doing globally. And one of the things that you very rightly we were talking about is that educational part. Of it. You said about spreading the Hindu part of the thing. We have to decolonize the Indian mind. Believe it or not, many Indians till today believe intrinsically that things Firangi are better than things foreign are better than India. Many a times I have heard industrialists say, bring a white guy and everything will be fine. All Indians will listen to it. We still suffer from that colonial mindset. We have major conversations going on how to decolonize the mind. What will lead to decolonization of the mind? Because that's critical. Because we have been brainwashed. Pe people like four of us are here. We are interacting daily with these pe people, right? We are able to assert ourselves because we are performing in a very high atmosphere. We have no margin of error. We perform very high. And I think we are living Swami Vivekananda's uh, three A's of awakened Indian, arisen Indian, and assertive Indian. That's what we are. And I have added the fourth A to that. It's called act. It's not enough to know, but you have to act as well. Now let's switch to one of the other just important... One, uh, just one yeah. point, Ruhutiji and Rakeshji may be able to you know, he, he knows numbers better, you know. Uh, the number of NGOs and has really gone down since uh, 1914, sorry, 2014. Is that uh, a fact? Absolutely. Absolutely, because most of the NGOs, as you know, were uh, just a way to bring money from yes. either Christian uh, missionary, for Christian missionaries into India, uh, and uh, or from Islamic nations to build masjids and for from Christian countries just to convert people. Uh, I belong to Punjab. I lived there for two years and there was hardly a single Christian when I lived there in 1960s. Today, there are, I would say, two, three, four million uh, Christians in Punjab. These are all Punjabi people and Sardars they are being given five lakh rupees each to convert. And it's so simple. If you go to Ludhiana, there are million, uh, uh, at least a half a million Muslims in Ludhiana alone. There were perhaps only a few thousand Muslims in 1960 when I lived there. So this is what has happened in India. And why? One, NGOs, as you mentioned, they, ha they have poured a lot of money in India. Number two, our leaders, Sonia Gandhi and, uh, and uh, Manmohan Singh, they actually opened the borders and, and, and let uh, Pakistani people enter the border and come and settle down in Punjab. And they increased the Muslim population. And Sonia Gandhi has uh, uh, given every incentive for people to be converted through NGOs uh, money that comes in inside India. But the NGOs have gone down a lot um, and uh, uh, th that information is true. But I don't know uh, how much, but I've read on Google and other social media, but you really can't believe each and everything uh, that you read on social media. Yeah, Bhavani, you wanted to yeah. say something. Yes, I just wanted to add something, you know, regarding personalization. If you remember the uh, Kanchi Shankracharya, you know, he, when he, he was trying to put a ban to personalization in Tamil Nadu, and for that, Jailalita was the CM at that time, and Sonia was uh, 
uh, at the at um, New Delhi, and they saw to it that he was jailed. He was arrested, and he was jailed so that he would stop all the activities which. Uh, were trying to hamper the proselytization process. We all know that Sonia Gandhi had ties to the Vatican, you know. I don't know, there are rumors that uh, she's part of Opus Dei. I don't know about that, but she does have very, very uh, strong ties. And her father was KGB. And that's how she got the name Sonia, because Sonia is not an Italian name. It's a, it's a, it's a Russian name. So a lot of ties everywhere. And of course, they didn't want uh, the Shankaracharya to be able to put a uh, to to uh, put a damper on those activities. No, I mean this is a this is a conversation that I would like to have with all three of you in one of the next sessions. Is is the state of affairs of Hindus, and because there is a I I I I bring the subject matter for your attention, so that when we talk next, it is there. You know, six years ago, a very famous Indian journalist, very famous, if I mentioned his name, you would know all of him. He's a good friend of mine. He wrote an article saying that Bhutto's thousand year war with India has another 950, 30, 50, 56 years to go. And I said to him that, no, you, are, you missed the basic point. Islam won its first thousand year war, if you were to say that, in Bhutto's thousand year war. Islam won it. Because where is our historical Mahabharata reference of Gandhar Naresh, Gandhar Kingdom? It's Afghanistan. Where is our entire Indus Valley, Love Kush and everything, Takshashila and everything? It's gone to Pakistan. Pakistan. And our Royal Bengal Tiger is part of Bangladesh now. Bangladesh. Right? right. So we have lost three big chunks of land which were part of, forget about the bigger Akhand Bharat, but even the significant Akhand Bharat, right in our immediate neighborhood, we have lost that. He replied to me that, yes, you are right. I didn't figure, I didn't think about it from that point of view. I said, that's exactly the point. The what actually is a threat, and he and I talked about it, that actually mm -hmm. India is facing an existential threat. Many Hindus don't like to hear it. India is facing an existential threat. It's not yes. the way that 1.3 billion Hindus will vaporize tomorrow. No, it's not going to happen. We are not going to disappear, but we are going to be rendered irrelevant in the conversation. We are not part of a religious conversation. We are not part of a mainstream conversation. We are those guys who are idol worshipers. We don't even, they, 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 don't, don't, they don't even consider part of humanity that we are not part of any religious order of Abrahamic belief system that our, but there is a hope here, and that's what I want to tell everybody, and I want to share with you. For me, the hope is that today the world recognizes one thing very seriously, that the, with the advent of science and, and, and technology, we know now things that we didn't know before. That's Sanatan Dharma. Sanatan Dharma is nothing else but essential theory, you know, essential living, our eternal principles. They are called eternal principles because they are relevant at any given point in time. It is, was as relevant 5,000 years ago as it is today. And I say this, and I'm telling all of you this. I have been bold enough to ask my Christian and Muslim friends, hey, who were you before you became Christian? Who were you before you became a Sikh or you became a, a Buddhist or you became a Jain or you became anything else? You were all Sanatanis. Mm -hmm. We were all yeah. Sanatanis. Every religion has a date to it. Sanatan existed, transcends all that date. So coming back to a very important topic, which I said we will talk about, uh, is the state of relationship of the India and the US. Uh, we had a remarkable relationship going on. India has always been, as I said in my opening statement, an important ally. Pakistan's prime minister made a statement on Thursday that the US has found a strategic partnership with India and uses Pakistan only to clear the dirt from Pakistan, Afghanistan, and when it needs us. So he's making his own little baby cry all the time. The point of the matter is India matters today, in my opinion. Whether Biden shares that particular anger about Modi's bonhomie with Trump is a different matter. These things people don't forget. But the important part is that somewhere along the line, India has become important not as only as an entity, but they know that the path to China cannot be one 
unless India is part of the game. That's why you have quad. Your thoughts on this, both, all three of you. You need not wait for me to come in, but Bhavani, in two minutes, your thought. Yeah. Well, what the, uh, the, the uh, relationship between the US and India has been like a roller coaster, you know? One minute it's up, one minute it's down. And as you very rightly pointed out, when we, the previous administration was in office, uh, I think, you know, the uh, great minds were thinking alike, you know, on various uh, strategic moves, whether it was defense, whether it was space, whether whether it was military enhancement, whether it was economic uh, cooperation, whether it was trade trade ag agreements, you know. So, you know, the, the, all things were, you know, in, they were seen up to high. Well, you don't know now, you know, how things what are is going your to phone? Is this your phone? No. I don't, it's not mine. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and uh, and now, um, so subsequently, we seem to you know have uh, been floundering a little bit. The Seventh Fleet, as you remember, sailed right through Indian territorial waters. Yes, that was supposed to be meant as a message to China, but what message was India supposed to get from that? You know. And it, after doing it, it was uh, an admission was made after the fact, you know, usually if somebody wants to any, any country wishes to uh, uh, sail certain areas, territorial areas, they take permission from the country adjoining and then they go through, usually it's not a problem. But that, but that, that, that did happen. And then re most recently for COVID supplies, uh, when we needed the raw materials, uh, uh, Punawala had to, you know, uh, request it and, you know, and repeatedly requested before the uh, raw source material was made available to India to make the vaccine. So, uh, but on the other hand, we do have uh, Blinken came by, you know, very, very recently. And, you know, uh, this way, I think now, uh, I think um, the strategic partnership would be with India against, uh, uh, with and uh, because of the Taliban uh, in Afghanistan and because of various forces and of course China. So you know the 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 best answer to China is India. Everybody knows it, and so so does the U.S. You know, so you know they do need India at this point more than ever. So the, the point is very well taken. Afghanistan is a challenge. I, I somehow feel very uncomf uncomfortable about it. Mm -hmm. After as many years, 20 years being in Afghanistan, this is a defeat of US worse than Vietnam, in my opinion. The US Army will take time to recover from this uh, lack of political leadership in handling the crisis in Afghanistan. And US became, you know, like Russia. They also failed. Yeah. The U.S. also became part of the graveyard that Afghanistan Yes, is Afghanistan is the graveyard of many an empire. Many empires. Yes. The point is, I'm concerned about one thing is that U.S. has, and I'm angry about that with Mr. Biden, that he's literally handing over Afghanistan to Taliban. And if anybody is, is slightly aware of the ground realities, Pakistan has a role to play. Pakistan does not want India-Afghanistan relationship to be good. And that's why they will do whatever it takes. China is literally walking in to grab Afghanistan. They are doing a deal mm. with Taliban. So that is the scenario there. Uh, U.S.-India relationship. How much do you think, Dr. Sharma, that India has not been smart enough in using or utilizing the U.S. Uh, relationship? Do you think so? I have been saying few negative things about India. If I say more, I think uh, Indians may not grant me visa to visit <laughs> India next time. Uh, but truthfully speaking, in the last 75 years, if uh, someone says how many years India had good foreign policy, I would say maybe 10 to 12 years during Vajpayee's time and Modi's time and maybe a couple of other years, rest of the time, India had a foreign policy that I would not give more than F. So they, were, they failed out of 75 years, 65 years, they completely failed. They had the worst foreign policy. And why do I say that? When India was offered permanent seat for United Nations, we gave it up and we offered it to China. When China occupied Tibet, Nehru didn't say anything. 
And to your viewers, I just want to say, uh, which has really nothing to do with your question, with the foreign policy, Balochistan gained independence on 11th of August in 1947 as a separate nation, which Pakistan grabbed later on. Does any Indian know that Balochistan was not part of Pakistan? I know. Absolutely not. Yes. Right? Yes, we do know. Very, yes, very few people. And that too in the last few years. For 65 years, Indian government never raised an issue that if Pakistan is crying about JNK, what happened to Balochistan? Anyway, our foreign policy has been terrible. Uh, regarding USA, what mm -hmm. mistakes we did, we all know. What good things we did only happened during George W. Bush's time and during President Obama's time. And those are the two presidents who actually did a lot for India than the last uh, 60 years combined. Uh, what India must do now, which they failed, was after 9-11, India had the best uh, opportunity to be the best buddy of United States. But what did we do? Zero policy and Pakistan gained everything after 9-11. And they billions of dollars and became best friends with US. And what we need to do now is, of course, we all know that US needs India because of uh, China. But India has never made itself available to United States, not as just someone that they definitely need because there's nobody else. But hey, listen, I'm a good guy. I'm the only good guy in that area. You should need me because I am a good guy, not because I'm countering China. And that's where we have been making mistake. We, you are absolutely right, our non-aligned policy the entire thing was an abject failure, total failure. And in all of this, if there is one name that was responsible for it, it was Nehru. Because he was the guy who surrendered the UNSC seat to China, and China is screwing us with us with that. We are the, he was the one who gave the Aksai Chin and others to not a grass, a blade of grass grows there. He is the one who messed up in Tibet. He is the architect of India's devastating foreign policy. That's the sad part. And the fact that we allowed it to happen, it irks me like crazy. Krishnaji, uh, you were saying- May I just say one, one, okay. one, one thing? Sure. Uh, but you know, in, in 71, when Indira Gandhi was uh, prime minister, at that point, you know, when she had gone to visit Nixon, Nixon told her in no uncertain terms, you know, don't mess with Pakistan or else. And so at that point, she actually left the White House. And, and uh, you know, when she was getting into her car, Kissinger asked her, she said, Madam, don't you think it could have been a little softer with the president? So she, so she said, you know, well, you know, when, when we have to say what we have to say at the right time, we must say it, she said. And she got into the car and left. And that was when we had that uh, Indo-Pak uh, conflict. And, we, and we, we drubbed Pakistan very soundly, as you remember, at, the, at that time. But, you know, so after that, you know, Nixon didn't interfere. But that was when the non-aligned movement, uh, I'm sorry, the non-aligned uh, uh, idea took place, you know, because of that. All right. Krishnaji. Can I, can I add something? Uh, add, uh, wait, let, nice... him, let, him, let, him, let him finish. Yeah. Then he will finish. Then you can come back. <laughs> I'll take away the corona question from you. <laughs> okay. To, yeah. to, to add to the list of Rakesh Ji, you know, I've, we did win the Bangladesh war, but how did we do in negotiations after that? Uh, th I don't think that was a very smart thing to have 95,000 soldiers and not gain, you know, benefit out of it. I don't think that was, that was also a big Congress mistake. You know, they could have done a much better deal with Pakistan at that time. Um, mm. So. Yes, we, I think we have not been very good in you know, foreign policy, but I will come back to what you said, Bhutiji. You know, at the time when we were getting wheat, PL480, I still remember that I was a young man, and to a time now when you know, India can afford everything, uh, it's a different economy, it's a different uh, level of uh, relationship. We may not be doing much, but they need us, and. 
uh, and I think India can use its uh, you know leverage. That's a very that's very well said about the leverage part of it because yes, you are right. Uh, Ninety six thousand soldiers. I I I am hundred percent sure. If God forbid, if Pakistan had ever captured ninety six thousand soldiers of India, they would demand all of India before releasing them. Look what they did in Kandahar uh, negotiation. Got the worst of terrorists. Got the best of deals because we wanted to save hundred lives. So the negotiation is tough. We have been weak. We have been eternally weak on that matter. So I think India needs to do much better. And I'm very happy that External Affairs Minister Mr. Jay Shankar has been. Uh, very forthcoming on this matter. I remember very clearly his statement that you will see a more muscled approach from India, and that's true. There has been a more muscled, uh, much more sharper foreign relationship, uh, external affairs ministry, not giving into things. Look at how India dealt with China in the Galwan Valley. Uh, you know that one of the important things is is the fact that Modi stood up to China. Modi stood up to Z. Manmohan Singh had no guts to stand up to China at all. So there have been significant changes on that account. But Indo-US relationship is something that America likes us, us all NRIs, because we contribute handsomely to their economy. And as a senator once told me that we love you Indians as immigrants to this country. You are educated, you are professionals, you work hard. You have family values. You take care of your children. You are in the highest median income, and you ask for nothing. And yes, one more important thing: you are least. You are not a law and order problem for us. Yeah, occasional white collar crime is a different matter, but you are not. Indians are not a law and order problem. Mm. Was a sense of appreciation. Have we, as a community, command? Do we, as a community, command a clout with them? That's the important part. That's something that we have missed out on. We have led a good life. We have been successful professionally, but it's for us to begin use Vivekananda's statements, assert ourselves. The one A that I would say that we don't need to prove to them how good we are, but we have to assert with them that yes, this is my pound of flesh, and I must have it. Finally, as the time is coming to an end. There is no discussion that is complete without coronavirus in place. It has been two years now, and a new variation has come. I said it in my opening statement that India was hit hard with the Delta variant in the second launch. Third one is coming. US is now getting much more worse. <clears throat> and thank God, New York Governor Cuomo is no more there, so no more senior citizens' death under his watch. And uh, you know. What do you have to say now? You are all three of you are doctors. What exactly is the story on it? Because I think Dr. Fauci has messed up in his explanations. He's he should stop his being on the TV. Now he's in, he is talking to TikTok people on the TV as to what to do about things. It's gone ridiculous. It's no longer civil. People don't even know, and that's the reason why people are wondering what to do and what not to do. So vaccination is good, no doubt about that. Taking medication is good, but there is an element of mistrust. You have equal amount of information being posted on internet that you know disgusting materials, suppressed materials are being used in the vaccination, which has nothing to do with the cure of anything else. Share your thoughts. I leave the floor to all three of you. Two minutes each, sir. Krishna ji, you start with that. Yeah, I will give one of my minutes to Rakesh ji. But uh, I, I totally <laughs> believe that we don't know too much about this virus, and uh, at some stage, this virus or another virus will have to coexist. We have to find that balance, and uh, where you know we do least damage to us, our economy, our existence, but at the same time, we can't live this the way we are living forever. Right. You know, there is a there is a, there is a very important book. Uh, somebody I know, Savio Rodriguez from Goa, he's a Goa Chronicle guy. He wrote a book. He and his friend Amit Pagaria wrote a book called "Modi Stole My Mask," and his research has completely indicated, just as the uh, research by the, the magazine of atomic scientists talked about the first article that I read, 
about the all proof shows that it came from the lab. The Democratic Party wants to hide it. They don't want to comment about that. So we know about that. So where do we go from here, Bhavani and then Rakesh? Well, you know, uh, you're talking about the manufactured virus, you know, that was pointed out in March of 2029. IIT scientists from India, you know, they analyzed the virus and they found that that the, to the coronavirus uh, added um, virions were, were put in place. They added an HIV virus. So some of the spikes, you know, contain that and that's yeah, made it, that gave it gain of function, what we would call gain of function. And right. that was one of the things that uh, Mr. Fauci, Dr. Fauci was hauled up for in front of Congress uh, right. uh, a couple of weeks ago. So gain of function was given to this virus in an artificial way. And that's why, you know, normally when, when somebody has a viral infection, like if you get a cold, for example, that's the type of coronavirus. The virus replicates, 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 and then slowly peters out and dies out, and you get better, normally, naturally. Whereas in this case, this, this particular virus, as it goes along, it gathers steam, it's mutating, it's getting more functions, and it's uh, unleashing and creating more havoc. So um, I think we have to learn to coexist with it, as uh, Dr. Uh, Buck pointed out. And I think going forward, just like we get a flu shot every year, we're probably going to have to get a, a, a COVID uh, shot every year to, to, to deal with the uh, ongoing variant in place at that time. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Rakeshi. Uh, there are two, three points. Number one, uh, India had beautiful chance to be champion during this COVID-19 crisis, but it failed. USA has made Moderna and Pfizer vaccine and AstraZeneca through, uh, through uh, Oxford University in, in collaboration with India. But India had its own vaccine. The production has been so slow, they can blame uh, shortage of raw material or USA did ABCD, whatever they want to do. Don't be a crybaby. You were given a chance. You had all the technology and you did not take advantage of that. You could have made billions of dollars and could have helped humanity humanity also. And I think that's where India has failed terribly. Why, why did it happen? Why did it fail? The, the reason being, uh, we have know-how, we had the research, we, we produced uh, uh, or made the uh, vaccine very nicely, but we just somewhere after a month or so, we just didn't have the stamina, uh, the push, uh, the efforts to make millions and millions of doses. If we had been smart, forget about the rest of the world, we would have made enough vaccine to vaccinate our own population in India. Hardly 4% Indians are vaccinated. So yeah. that's point number one. Since I don't have time, I, I will not keep on blaming India more and more. But what COVID has done is short-term damage to the world is so much that in my lifetime, I don't think I have seen or I will see in the rest of my life, unless China unleashes few more viruses in the next few years. This trillions of dollars of damage and roughly 6 million people dead, so many millions infected. We have been living in fear Economies are shattered. Millions of businesses are, are gone or shut forever. But now what do we do? I can only tell you one thing. There was a, one study done by Maryland in June, in the month of June. In Maryland, 95% people who were admitted with COVID-19 infection in June were people who were not vaccinated. Only 5% patients admitted in the hospital were vaccinated. In my own experience right now, I am seeing in my hospital about 80% patients who are admitted or who get really bad, 90% uh, patients who get really bad are those who are not vaccinated. So the answer for the short term is vaccination, vaccination, vaccination. Yes, in USA, there is no shortage anymore, but you go to the rest of the world, there are more than 7 billion people I don't think 6 billion people will get vaccine 
in the next year or two. And what do we do with Delta variant? Unless everybody's vaccinated, you will get infected and virus is not gonna die that quickly. Number two, less and less people being vaccinated, you are giving chance to virus to mutate more and more to more dangerous form or a form which is easily transmissible. That's what Delta has done. The whole family gets infected. A year ago, when we had a plain COVID-19 virus, even if husband and wife were sleeping in the same room, only one person was getting infect infection. It was not easily transmissible. Now the story is different. And that's why in India, three months ago, you saw the whole families are dying or in the hospital and because they had Delta and that's what Delta is going to do. Whether we need booster every year or not, I don't know. But right now, everyone must get vaccination. If US can pass some kind of law, like you know, Mount Sinai Hospital told today, if you want to work in our hospital, you must be vaccinated. There's some private corporation U.S. Army, they all we are, have we are, we, are, we are out of time now. And mm. thank you very much, all of you, for being for such a wonderful conversation of uh, hope, despair, and promise. That's what life is all about. Uh, it's never perfect. It, it is all about looking towards uh, what is next. So we have to prepare for that, essentially. So ladies and gentlemen, all the viewers, have a great week ahead. Happy great weekend and happy Independence Day to India. And on the closing, I would say, Pakistan, it's your Independence Day. Make good use of that. Thank you, Bhavani. Thank you, Dr. Krishna Bhatt. And thank you, Rakesh Ji, for being here, all of you. See you again sometime next. <laughs>